afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you back here uh, for this uh, Palestine Center event today. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of uh, administrative announcements. First, of course, if you could turn off uh, your cell phones so that we can give our attention to our speaker today, it would be much appreciated. Uh, also, uh, for those watching online, you can participate in the question and answer session uh, via Facebook or uh, Twitter or on the chat roll on the uh, live uh, streaming page. You could send your questions to us via Twitter by sending them to uh, at Palestine Center and we will uh, do our best to put those questions to our speaker today and get a response uh, for the live stream audience as well. Before we get into today's program, just a couple of announcements about upcoming events. We've got a great slate of uh, events for this fall, uh, including a fantastic exhibit that is uh, currently in our gallery now called The Map Is Not the Territory, uh, which brings together the common narratives of Palestinians, Irish, and Native uh, Americans in the struggle over lost territory. Uh, and we've got a great film that is part of that exhibit in a series of events this Friday uh, at 6 p.m. Uh, so you could find announcements about that, of course, on our website and um, on the table, uh, information table outside. Uh, following that, on the 30th of September, uh, we're going to have a very important uh, event on uh, prolonged Israeli occupation and Palestinian child prisoners. Uh, and we will have a briefing here by uh, the uh, good people at the Defense for Children International uh, in Palestine talking about um, Palestinian children uh, imprisoned by the Israeli occupation. Uh, and then on October 2nd, we'll have our annual Edward Said Memorial Lecture. Uh, this year's lecturer is Najla Said, and she will be speaking about, uh, of course, um, uh, her father's contributions and also her uh, new book, Looking for Palestine. On to today's event, we're very happy uh, to be able to have the launch of uh, a national book tour uh, for uh, Josh Rubner, who's written uh, a really important contribution on uh, what I believe is really the, the first book out on the Obama administration's uh, failure to broker uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace. The book is Shattered Hopes. Uh, Josh will uh, have copies of the book here and we'll be happy to sign and sell them to you after the uh, event, of course. Uh, and uh, the book looks at the um, many reasons why the uh, Obama administration began with great optimism in their efforts towards uh, pushing the peace process forward and ultimately ended in great frustration. Uh, Josh is the National Advocacy Director for the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation, uh, which is a national coalition of more than 400 organizations, including this organization, uh, that is working to change U.S. policy towards Israel and Palestine in support of human rights, international law, uh, and equality. Uh, prior to that, he was an analyst in Middle East affairs at the Congressional uh, Research Service, and uh, much more information about this book can be uh, viewed at www.shattered dash hopes.com. Uh, please join me in welcoming Josh to speak on this book, Shattered Hopes. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Yusuf, and it's really an honor to be able to launch my book here today at the Palestine Center, Shattered Hopes. Obama's failure to broker Israeli-Palestinian peace. Undoubtedly, the most complex international negotiations that ever took place were in the aftermath of World War I in what became known as the Paris Peace Conference. And at the Paris Peace Conference, more than 32 nations and countries gathered. Hundreds of causes were represented and in the course of just one year, one year, entire empires that had existed for centuries were obliterated and new nations arose in their place. And in the aftermath of the Paris Peace Conference, virtually the entire map for the world was 
with, with, uh, was redrawn as the Allied victorious powers assumed colonial mandates over portions of Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. Now, don't get the wrong impression. Lots of decisions that were taken at the Paris Peace Conference were terrible ones. And a lot of them, if you look at today's Middle East, a lot of the decisions made before, during, after, during and after World War I, the results are still reverberating today in the type of border conflicts and sectarian conflicts that we're seeing today based on the borders drawn there. But my point in raising this is that all of this was done and the entire map of the world was redrawn in the span of one year from 1919 to 1920. In South Africa, there were 350 years of racial discrimination and 40 plus years of formalized, institutionalized apartheid against black South Africans. When a decision was taken to end the system of formalized, institutionalized racism and to negotiate an end to the apartheid system in South Africa, negotiations between the government and the African National Congress took three years, leading to South Africa's first ever multiracial elections won by the ANC and Nelson Mandela just one year later, a four-year process in total. In Northern Ireland, the Good Friday Agreement, brokered in 1998, capped two years of negotiations over what was an 800-year struggle for power. Now, why do I raise these three historical examples? And certainly, we can point to others as well. As many of you know, last Friday marked the 20th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Principles, or more commonly known as the Oslo Accords, between Israel and the PLO, launching what was supposed to have been a five-year interim negotiating process that was to have led to a peace treaty and an end of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. If everything could be rearranged in the entire world following World War I in the span of one year, if apartheid could be ended in South Africa within the span of three years, and if an end to the conflict in Northern Ireland could be brokered in two, certainly there is no absolute reason why the Israeli-Palestinian conflict should take more than 20 years for peace to be brokered. Now, we hear quite a lot, and especially from those people who perpetuate what I like to call the peace process industry, that there is something about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in particular that is just so complex and so difficult to fathom. And that if you don't have this insider expertise that the peace process industry players have, well, you simply don't understand how difficult this situation is to resolve and why it's taking so long. Well, I would humbly disagree with the notion that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is intrinsically more complex or difficult to resolve than the aftermath of World War I, than apartheid in South Africa, than the decolonization and independence of Algeria, than power sharing in Northern Ireland. All of these were extremely difficult and complex issues to resolve as well. So let's take a few minutes to step back from the so-called complexity of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to simplify it. Since the late 1800s, the 1880s, the Zionist movement has been engaged in a project to buy and purchase land in historic Palestine for the exclusive benefit and use of the Jewish people. And since World War I, and in the aftermath of World War I, as we all know, Britain got a mandate to govern Palestine. Since World War I, the Zionist movement and Britain worked hand in glove to prepare Palestine to become 
according to the Balfour Declaration, a Jewish homeland. As Britain withdrew from its mandate in the aftermath of World War II in 1947, as we know, at a time when Jews owned 7% of the land of historic Palestine and Palestinians inhabited 93%, and at a time when Jews made up one-third of the population and indigenous Palestinians made up two-thirds, the issue was moved to the newly created UN. And the UN, in its infinite wisdom, said, let's partition this land, and let's create a Jewish state in 55% of this land, even though within this 55%, there'll just be a bare majority of Jews as compared to Palestinians. And let's reserve the 45% of historic Palestine for its indigenous inhabitants. Well, of course, as we all know, the partition plan was never implemented. And as a result of the 1948 war, Israel ethnically cleansed roughly three quarters of a million Palestinians from their homes, demolished, raised, between four and 500 Palestinian villages and exiled approximately 750,000 to a million Palestinians from their homes and lands and properties. When an armistice agreement was signed in 1949 with Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and Egypt, the newly created state of Israel found itself in control of 78% of historic Palestine with the remaining 22% being the Gaza Strip and West Bank under the control of Egypt and Jordan. And as we know, since 1967, Israel has placed under a belligerent military occupation those remaining Palestinian territories, those 22% of historic Palestine, the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem. And so what we have today is a situation where Israel exercises control over 100% of historic Palestine with Palestinians relegated to either minimum human and political rights or none whatsoever based on where they live. If you are one of the 1.5 million Palestinian citizens of Israel, yes, you do enjoy some individual democratic rights like the right to vote, the right to form a political party, but you face widespread societal discrimination. You face discrimination in terms of budgetary allocations from the state. You face severe restrictions on how and if and whether you can expand your lands. The discrimination faced today by Palestinian citizens of Israel is analogous in many respects to the conditions that obtained here in the Jim Crow South. If you are one of more than five million Palestinians who are registered as a refugee, you have been denied your internationally guaranteed right of return to your homes and properties for now more than 65 years and are forced to languish in refugee camps because Israel will not allow the right of return to be implemented even though this was an explicit agreement and condition of Israel joining the UN in 1949. And if you're one of the 4.5 million Palestinians living in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza Strip, you have been subjected to the most brutal military occupation imaginable for now almost the past half century. This is the condition that obtains. It is not that difficult to understand. It's a condition in the situation of apartheid. It's a condition in the situation where Israeli Jews have their individual and national rights in full, and Palestinians enjoy extremely circumscribed or limited political rights or none whatsoever. And these rights are differentiated based on one's national identity based on one's religious affiliation. And this is the very definition of apartheid. Apartheid is legal discrimination based on one's nationality, ethnicity, race, religion, etc. And in the 1970s, the international community made it a crime against humanity to establish and perpetuate systems of apartheid. So when you boil it down, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not all that complex nor difficult to understand. There's a situation where you have an oppressor versus an oppressed, a people with their rights versus a people without their rights. And this is a situation that must be remedied. Now the second reason why I raise these historical examples 
and especially the one of Northern Ireland, is because it's incredibly pertinent for a discussion of the Obama administration's approach towards trying to broker Israeli-Palestinian peace. Many of you might remember that George Mitchell was the U.S. mediator who brokered the Good Friday Agreement, paving the way to an end of the conflict in Northern Ireland. And this had ramifications when he was appointed special envoy for Middle East peace by President Obama in 2009. I want to read a little section of my book to illustrate the influence Mitchell's thinking on his experiences in Northern Ireland had for his policies as special envoy. Mitchell himself would often rely on his experiences in Northern Ireland to explain and guide his approach to resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. When he was appointed special envoy, Mitchell noted that his job, like his previous mediation role, would require patience and perseverance. In negotiating peace in Northern Ireland, Mitchell remarked, quote, we had 700 days of failure and one day of success. For most of the time, progress was non-existent or very slow. So I understand the feelings of those who may be discouraged about the Middle East. And he relates the story how after speaking to an audience in Jerusalem about his role in brokering peace in Northern Ireland, Mitchell joked that, quote, an elderly gentleman came up to me and he said, did you say 800 years? And I said, yes, 800. He repeated the number again and I repeated it again. He said, oh, such a recent argument. No wonder you resolved it. So this was the experience that Mitchell had in mind when he was appointed by President Obama, a special envoy for Middle East peace on Obama's second day in office. But before getting to the role that Mitchell played from 2009 to 2011, we have to ask ourselves, why has the United States consistently and repeatedly failed in its efforts to broker Israeli-Palestinian peace predating Obama? because I don't want to give you the wrong impression. My critiques of US policy are not solely restricted to what's taken place over the last five years, although this book does focus on those events. Well, I think that the participants of the peace process from the US side speak best for themselves. Here's what Dennis Ross, who was the key peace process player in Bush won and Clinton eras and came back for Obama eras. Here's what he said about the U.S. methodology for trying to broker Israeli-Palestinian peace. He called what he did, quote, selling. Selling became part of our modus operandi, beginning a pattern that would characterize our approach throughout the Bush and Clinton years. We would take Israeli ideas or ideas that the Israelis could live with and work them over, trying to increase their attractiveness to the Arabs. Notice he won't call them Palestinians, but they're the undifferentiated Arabs. Trying to increase their attractiveness to the Arabs while trying to get the Arabs to scale back their expectations. This is what the prime US peace process mediator says about how these negotiations actually work. So is it any wonder with that biased mentality that self-admittedly pro-Israel that the U.S. has failed to be an honest broker and resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? I don't think any rational person would think that that is a fair way for a broker to behave. More succinctly, this mentality was encapsulated by Aaron David Miller, another prime peace process player during the Clinton and Bush II administration when he simply referred to the U.S. role as being Israel's lawyer. And this is indeed how the United States has functioned for the last two decades, if not more. And as I argue in my book, it's exactly how the Obama administration perpetuated this policy despite some potential movement away from it at the outset, which we'll discuss in just a few moments. One of the questions I asked myself as I was writing this book is, 
Was Obama any different in his approach to brokering Israeli-Palestinian peace than his predecessors? And to an extent, I think that he absolutely was. Here's what he said out on the campaign trail when he didn't think that there were any people from the media listening to his conversation. This is what he said to an activist who I interviewed named Sue Dravis, who's a member of the Muscatine County Democratic Central Committee. She asked candidate Obama back in March of 07, what will you do that will be different, that will address the humanitarian as well as the human rights crisis for the Palestinians now? And Obama had a very long, very nuanced, very well thought out response. And as part of that response, he said, nobody's suffering more than the Palestinian people from this whole process. And now when this leaked to the media, David Axelrod, his campaign advisor, immediately clarified Obama's remarks to mean that, well, of course Palestinians are suffering due to the terrible leadership of Hamas. It's all their own fault. Well, Obama said nothing of the sort uh, in his initial comments. And it was clear that he had a certain understanding and empathy for the Palestinian narrative of suffering and dispossession that no other person inhabiting the White House, including President Jimmy Carter, had. I think this is made quite clear even after he was president, when he went to Cairo in June 2000 of, of nine, and you'll remember the so-called attempt to reset U.S. relations with the Muslim world. And I thought that President Obama said something very profound in this speech in Cairo. He said it was, quote, undeniable that the Palestinian people, Muslim and Christians, have suffered in pursuit of a homeland. For more than 60 years, they've endured the pain of dislocation. Many wait in refugee camps in the West Bank, Gaza, and neighboring lands for a life of peace and security that they have never been able to lead. They endure the daily humiliations, large and small, that come with occupation. This, I thought, was a path-breaking statement because it recognized, maybe for the first time ever, on behalf of a sitting U.S. president, that not only are Palestinians suffering indignities and human rights violations at the hands of Israeli military occupation, but also paid homage to the fact that Palestinian refugees have been dispossessed for more than 60 years and that they too are suffering. This I took as an indication that yes, President Obama came at this issue from a different place than any of his predecessors. Number two, the reason why I think Obama was to an extent different from his predecessors was because he appointed George Mitchell as his special envoy for Middle East peace. There had been a long-standing tradition of appointing individuals during the Bush one administration, during the Clinton administration, during the Bush two administration of individuals with self-admittedly and obvious pro-Israel ideological baggage. This was no secret. As you can see, Dennis Ross bragged about the pro-Israel orientation that he brought to the so-called peace process. The fact that Mitchell was appointed, who had none of these connections, none of this ideological baggage, clearly riled the Israel lobby. Number three, for the first six months of his term, President Obama and his foreign policy team were so vehemently insisted, insistent on Israel freezing its colonization of Palestinian lands. This was not a joke. The Obama administration was absolutely serious and vehement in its denunciations of Israeli colonization, to an extent, again, not seen since the Carter administration. So to an extent, yes, Obama did have a different approach. But was Obama different? Well, to another extent, no. Because at the very same time, that Obama was expressing sympathy for Palestinians killed in Israel's horrific attack on Gaza in December 2008 and January 2009, Operation Cast Lead, which massacred more than 1,400 Palestinians. At that very same time, Obama was allowing for the shipment 
of 300 containers full of ammunition to go to Israel. This was at a time when Human Rights Watch put out a report saying that Israel's use of U.S. provided white phosphorus was a war crime and that those exports should be ended immediately. This was at the same time that Amnesty International put out a call for an international arms embargo against Israel. And here you have President Obama sending more weapons to Israel only three months after the bombs had stopped falling. This was a prelude to what became the most intensely escalated policy of military aid, military coordination, and military cooperation between the United States and Israel of any president. Now, as we all know, there's been a lot of policy disagreements between the Netanyahu government and the Obama administration, and a lot of them have obviously been very public. We all know that. But there's one thing that every single Israeli and American politician can agree upon, and that is that under Obama, there has never been more or greater military cooperation between the two countries. And I think this was stated best by Andrew Shapiro, who was at the time Hillary Clinton's sec Assistant Secretary of State for Political Military Affairs. He spoke at the Saban Center, which is part of the Brookings Institute, named after uh, an Israeli-American who self-admittedly donates his money to help Israel. And he gave an incredible speech there back in 2010. And what Shapiro said was this. He said, uh, sorry, just let me find it here quickly. He said that the U.S.-Israel military relationship is broader, deeper, more intense than ever before. And undoubtedly it is. Another reason why Obama hasn't been as different as he may have appeared from his rhetoric is the fact that when faced with pressure coming from the Israel lobby for the positions he articulated, he was absolutely unwilling to stand up to these challenges and capitulated completely to the Israel lobby as so many other U.S. presidents have done. Now, I think the key moment to understanding the beginning of Obama's switch on this issue are a series of events that took place in the summer of 2009. In the summer of 2009, Dennis Ross, who I quoted before, was moved from a very obscure position in the State Department over to the National Security Council, where Obama said from now on, Ross would now, quote, quarterback all Middle East issues. This was clearly the start of a huge policy shift on the part of the Obama administration. Because what Ross said after his appointment, that the, quote, problem with the Obama administration's policy on freezing Israeli settlements was that it put the emphasis on one issue when it wasn't the only or even most important issue and in any case needed to be put in context. This is a direct quote from Dennis Ross on assuming this position. And from this perch where he was quarterbacking all Middle East issues, he proceeded methodically to undermine George Mitchell at every opportunity to undermine the Obama administration's insistence that Israel frees all colonization of Palestinian land. And you can see the effect of this move already by July 2009, when President Obama holds a closed door meeting with very high ranking individuals from high profile Jewish American organizations. And I love this, Abe Foxman, the head of the Anti-Defamation League had just a few months before publicly criticized the Obama administration for quote-unquote neutrality by appointing George Mitchell as a special envoy. So in this July 2009 closed-door meeting, here you have the self-same Abe Foxman expressing concern that the Obama administration was not being quote even-handed anymore. 
And instead of defending his position that yes, Israel should freeze its colonization of Palestinian lands because it's illegal and because Israel had already committed to doing it three or four times in the past, this is what Obama told Abe Foxman behind closed doors. Abe, you're absolutely right and we are gonna fix that. Noting, quote, that the sense of even-handedness has to be restored. But what Obama did was not restore the even-handedness. What he did was forget about any pretense of trying to assume a policy of even-handedness what he instead meant was that I'm going back to the status quo. I'm going back to the way things were of coordinating my positions with Israel and then tag teaming to try to force these positions on the Palestinians. And you can see very clearly this process at work within the Palestinian negotiating team thanks to the leaks to Al Jazeera in the Palestine papers. Let me read you just a couple of quotes. In May 2009, President Abbas met Obama for the first time. And it was an incredibly upbeat meeting. And what happened behind this closed door meeting was that Obama reassured Abbas, quote, the establishment of the Palestinian state is a must for me personally. In an expeditious manner, we will get to the two state solution. And Obama was telling Abbas that everything that he was hearing from the president, he was saying the exact same thing to Israel. In a report back to the Palestinian negotiating team, the lead Palestinian negotiator, Dr. Saleh Barakat, marveled at this change atmosphere that was coming out of the Obama administration. And he told his team, the Washington, oh, I, I love this, much of what I say to you today is just between us, little realizing that this was gonna get leaked. The Washington I went to last week isn't the Washington I knew before. So this was how the Palestinian negotiating team was feeling in May of 2009, that maybe they were actually finally going to get a fair shake from the United States. Fast forward to after Ross's move to the NSC, towards after this flip-flop where Obama says he's not going to insist on Israel freezing its colonization, to a meeting, a very contentious meeting, held between U.S. and Palestinian negotiating teams in September of 2009. By this time, it was already crystal clear to the Palestinian negotiating team that what the United States was going to do was go behind the Palestinians' back and cut a deal with Israel that would be a fig leaf on the halting of settlements and to pressure Palestinians back to the table uh, on this basis. And so I, I, love, I love this quote. I wonder sometimes if when people are in these meetings, they wonder if their words are sometimes going to get leaked. Uh, because if I were David Hale, who was George Mitchell's assistant, I would be quite embarrassed by this reasoning. What David Hale said in this meeting was he said he understood Palestinian, quote, misgivings regarding the quality of the package with Israel, referring to the so-called settlement freeze. But he noted, we will not be able to meet all expectations of all parties. In the aggregate, it's a good package. And he added that Palestinians should not hold out for a comprehensive freeze of Israeli colonization of their lands because after all, quote, a freeze is a flexible concept. <laughs> and so at this point, Saeb Erekat, the lead Palestinian negotiator, gets livid. He says, you spent eight months with the Israelis, no time with me. We at least need to spend some more time to build a political framework. Maybe you don't have a plan. If you do, then you have to lay it out. Uh, and then Ellicott says, I hope that we will not be put in this position, except or else, like previous US administrations. It's not that we don't want to, we can't. So please don't put us in this position. To allow us to help you, you need to help us. But of course, that's exactly what the Obama administration did. It put the Palestinians into the position where they were forced to come to the negotiating table under this fig leaf of the Israeli settlement moratorium or be risk seen as being the rejectionist party who weren't willing to negotiate. Another way, a third way that Obama was no different and perhaps even worse than his predecessors on this issue 
is how he dealt with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in international fora like the UN. And I spend the better part of a chapter in here detailing, thanks to Bradley uh, slash Chelsea Manning's leaks through WikiLeaks, all of the sordid details of how the United States worked in collusion with Israel to kill the Goldstone Report. The Goldstone Report being the internationally mandated report in the aftermath of Operation Cast Lead that found that both Israel and Palestinian armed groups had committed human rights violations, violations of international law, war crimes, and possible crimes against humanity in Operation Cast Lead. And this is a very sordid tale. I can't go through all the details of it here. Uh, suffice it to say that one of these leaked documents from WikiLeaks is from a meeting between Israeli Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman and U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Susan Rice, where Lieberman thanked Ambassador Rice for the U.S. position on the Goldstone Report. And Rice beamed about, quote, the positive U.S. engagement with the Israeli missions in New York and Geneva to blunt the effects of the Goldstone Report in those fora. So behind the scenes, even though Obama was getting awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, for what I don't know, he was working hand in glove with Israel to make sure that it was not held accountable for the war crimes and crimes against humanity that it committed. And there are many, many examples of this that I don't have time to get into today, but that are detailed in the book. The Obama administration did the exact same thing to kill international accountability efforts after Israel attacked the flotilla in 2010. And of course, when Palestine tried to join the UN, a very similar thing took place. Now, in addition to Obama failing for all of those reasons, which I think are quite extensive enough to understand why this policy didn't work, there were other problematic aspects to the policy, including the fact that when negotiations were finally reconvened in 2010, George Mitchell publicly said, there's no terms of reference. In other words, throw out 20 or 18 years at the time, history of negotiation, throw out UN resolutions, throw out international law. None of that matters because when the parties come to Washington, they're going to sit down and they're going to determine the terms of reference for these negotiations by themselves. For me, this was a monumental mistake by George Mitchell, by George Mitchell who surely knew better than to allow a stronger party to the conflict to try to uh, impose terms of reference on negotiations in the absence of any reference to international law. Now, where are we today? Hope springs eternal for those who believe in the peace process. And we all know that Obama went to Jerusalem in March of this year. We all know that Secretary of State John Kerry engaged in an intensive and extensive rounds of shuttle diplomacy to bring the parties back to the table yet again at the end of July, this month promising that after 20 years of failed negotiations, they're finally going to get it right in the, in the framework of nine months this time around. Well, I would like to be optimistic about these negotiations, but I cannot because Obama in his second term is even worse than he was in the first term on this issue. In the first term, at least you had the pretense of the Obama administration giving lip service to a freeze on Israel's colonization of Palestinian land. This time around, you have Secretary of State John Kerry publicly saying that we know that Israel is going to be expanding settlements during these negotiations, and it's not a problem from our perspective. This is what John Kerry said, not in those exact words, but that's the gist of it. And since these negotiations were relaunched in July, Israel has, in fact, announced the expansion of more than 3,000 settlement units. Number two, why Obama is worse in his second term than his first, is that at least Obama tried in his first term to appoint an individual who was not encumbered by this ideological baggage of coming from the pro-Israel lobby. Well. In Obama's second term, he's appointed Martin Indyk as his special envoy 
for Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. This is the same Martin Indyk, who used to work for the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, the same Martin Indyk, who then went to work for its sister think tank, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, and the same Martin Indyk who tweeted after John Kerry resumed negotiations, by Jove, he's done it, pieces at hand, or something nonsense like that. Now, these negotiations have been going on since July, as I mentioned. What's actually taken place? Well, they've been mostly tight-lipped, the negotiators, but already the Palestinian negotiating team has become so frustrated that they are leaking to the press about how ridiculous these negotiations are. Here is Yasser Abid Rabu, who has been one of the primary Palestinian negotiators since Oslo in 1993. He said on Voice of Palestine earlier this month, these negotiations are futile and won't lead to any results. And indeed, just two days later, the Palestinian negotiating team leaked the details of what Israel was proposing in these negotiations to the AP. And what Israel's proposing is that it annex 40% of the West Bank, that it keep every single Israeli settlement in place, and that it keep control of the border with Jordan and military bases throughout the Jordan River Valley. And this is obviously not a serious negotiating position. This is not a serious negotiating stance for a real and legitimate two-state solution if such a thing still exists. This is clearly a delaying tactic. This is clearly a process in which Israel is engaged to deflect international pressure from its ongoing colonization and apartheid policies toward the Palestinians. For as long as there's the pretense of negotiation, and as long as Secretary of State John Kerry can get up and credibly say that the parties are talking, and they're talking seriously, and they're getting close to an agreement, it fends off the pressure on Israel. Well, what I've learned from the process of writing this book and working with the US campaign to end the Israeli occupation is that you cannot rely on the politicians. The politicians are not going to bring about a just and lasting peace. They are not going to bring about self-determination for the Palestinian people. Only we can help do that. And the mechanism through which we can do that is by joining the Palestinian Civil Society-led call for boycotts, divestment, and sanctions against Israel and against corporations and institutions that are complicit in and profiting from its apartheid policies toward the Palestinian people. Thank you very much. Uh, Dan Lieberman. Yeah, I think uh, one thing that uh, prevents the really resolution is we keep using the word conflict. But a conflict seems to conjure up to people's minds that you have two parties of almost equal power, almost the same objectives. But that is not the case here. There really is no conflict when when the U.S. asks for negotiations to end the conflict, it's invisible conflict, so the negotiations won't lead anywhere. When the Palestinians join it, they're joining something that's really invisible. What it is is an oppression, it's an apartheid, and it's a crisis. And I think if we stick to those words, I think we might make a little bit more headway. Thank you, Oscar Ordenis. Uh, yeah, in your book, do you include uh, something concerning the degradation of the American democracy because of the role of money? Second question, what is actually then the objective of the United States, uh, strategically speaking? Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Phil Schrafer. Uh, I have actually no credentials except that I'm a neighbor here. Uh, first point, um, it, 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 your talk suggests that if we had a good leader in position, um, uh, we, things would have been much better. I, th I think the, the president won the election. Uh, he would have given a lot to Romney if he had kept Mitchell in and, and tried to stop the uh, addition of the settlements in the West Bank. He would have possibly lost the election. The Democratic Party is maybe not an overstatement, but probably is owned by 
uh, uh, APAC and other organizations. Uh, I, I think your vision of the solution is, is partially right, but I think you need a broader, a broader vision and how to, because changing presence obviously is not one of the answers. Yeah, great questions and comments. Uh, I, I agree that the word conflict doesn't do full justice uh, to, to the situation. Um, and I certainly use lots of other uh, adjectives and nouns to describe the situation uh, in the book, but it's a point well taken. Uh, I do have a whole chapter in the book on the 2012 elections, and a big part of that is the role of money in the elections. And what I found based on researching uh, public disclosure of finance laws was that the Citizens United Supreme Court case made things much, much worse. Because if you look at the top 100 individual donors to these new super PACs that were created by the Supreme Court decision, uh, at least three or four of the top 100 donate specifically or primarily because they want to keep U.S. policy toward Israel the way it is, including the top one, Sheldon Adelson, who donated untold millions, I think at least 50 million, maybe as many as 80 million dollars into the election process in 2012. So yeah, I do address that. What is the United States role? What are they hoping to get out of this strategically? I think they're trying to just appease the Israel lobby. I don't think there's a lot of strategy behind it. I think that the Obama administration is hoping against hope, especially given its huge policy failures in Egypt, in Syria, throughout the Arab world in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. I think it's hoping against hope that it can just put this issue on the back burner and hope that it doesn't boil over and let someone else deal with it. Uh, I, wish, I wish I could say that we had better policy making and more strategic policy making than that, but I don't think we do. Uh, and then the, the last question, can you remind me of the gist of it? Ah, uh, yes, uh, I remember now, yes. No, I totally agree with you that the issue is not who inhabits the White House. Uh, as I make very clear throughout the book, there are structural issues at play that bind and constrain any inhabitant of the White House. Uh, so for example, when Obama came out very strongly against Israel's colonization of Palestinian land at the outset of his term, AIPAC immediately mobilized counter pressure through the Senate and three quarters of the Senate, it was actually 76 senators, sent Obama what I call a cease and desist letter. Don't you dare do this in public anymore was basically the gist of this letter. And that triggered Ross's appointment and the reassessment of policy. So it is very much structural, but I think in some respects that's a good thing because we can help change the structure of that policy that makes it so biased and so inadequate. Um, picking up on that theme, but related to a slightly different topic, do you think that APAC's seeming um, overreach recently in terms of their push to um, attack Syria and the reaction against that offers any kind of <coughs> template, if you will, for how to, you know, get a wedge in, so to speak, for people working on this issue? Hello, my name is Yusri Odi. I'm from Palestine. Yeah, my question is, do you think that the Palestinians could achieve better if they got different negotiation team, like the same team been negotiating for a while? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think that APAC's inability to push through authorization for the use of force in Syria is a, is a turning point uh, in this issue. I don't think APAC was the primary driver of this. I think Yusuf and I were actually talking about this beforehand. They actually came on board to the discussion rather late. 
so I think it was just kind of a situation where they felt that they needed to take a position on it, but I don't think they really engaged a lot of muscle uh, behind behind the effort, and they quickly got outpaced by events. So, no, I don't think it, it is a fundamental change. But I do think one of the things that I address in this book is how this issue is becoming just another one of the bitter uh, mudslinging partisan issues that divide the parties. There used to be absolutely 100% agreement. We all love Israel, and there's no difference between Democrats and Israel. We love Israel equally. Now, the parties are fighting against each other to say, I'm more pro-Israel than you are. <laughs> and this is, this is causing a lot of uh, cracks, and it's making some things interesting, I think. And I think what you're seeing right now is how Israel is being used by the Republican Party as a wedge issue to try to beat Obama over the head with. Uh, and I think that as, as I document in the book, people who are the professional pro-Israel lobby, they're very, very concerned about this development because they don't want it to become an issue like health care or like uh, whatever other issue splits us on a partisan basis. They want that bipartisan comedy. Um, would Palestinians do better with a different negotiating team? I think that there were some unfair attacks on uh, the Palestinian negotiating team after the Palestine papers. And I looked very carefully at this, and I looked at some of the charges about, oh, Saeb Arakat sold out the biggest Yerushalayim ever to Israel. Well, actually, if you look at the document, what he was telling Mitchell in that document was that what you're proposing to me is that Palestinians give up the biggest greater Jerusalem to Israel ever. But he wasn't saying that he wanted to do that. So there was a lot of uh, unfair criticism directed at them. I'm not standing up here either defending or disapproving of their actions. What I do think, though, is that clearly Palestinians need a new strategy. And that new strategy is coming from civil society in the form of boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Because while these negotiations have proved to be nothing more than a pretext and a cover for Israel to continue its colonization of Palestinian lands, the Palestinian-led movement for boycott, divestment, and sanctions is actually moving billions of dollars away from companies that are profiteering from Israel's policies. So that, to me, is a much more fruitful uh, avenue to pursue than sitting around uh, the negotiating table in what even Palestinian negotiators are recognizing to be a fruitless effort. If you have a, a question, ma'am, we'd be happy to take it, but just let us know and, and we can get to you and also here, and we have a question uh, from online as well. Go ahead, ma'am. Uh, Mary Listen, I'm an independent observer. Um, well, actually, I have more than one question. What is the administrative makeup right now in Palestine? Like when they travel, what citizenship or, or stateless status do they have? Uh, th next question would be, is there any kind of a framework for a monetary system or would they be using, if Palestine gets independence, would they, they already have been acknowledged by the United Nations, would they be uh, using the Israeli currency um, and uh, yeah and what what companies are uh, you suggesting should be boycotted okay you want to say something about travel documents well, I mean, that's an idea. well when you get when you get to okay. the uh, the others and I'll try to address them as quickly so in terms of corporations to boycott and engage in divestment efforts from if you go to our website and the occupation.org we've got campaigns against a whole bunch of them caterpillar uh, Motorola Veolia, uh, settlement products like Ahava and SodaStream, which are now being integrated into Samsung refrigerators. You know, the SodaStream product, it's actually a pretty uh, neat invention if it weren't for the fact that it was built in an Israeli settlement. It's like a home carbonation device. So there's lots of other ones that you can get instead. And they've made huge inroads into the U.S. market. Uh, they had a Super Bowl ad last year. So those kind of corporations, Caterpillar's demolishing Palestinian homes, building Israeli settlements, building the Israeli wall, uh, et cetera, uh, and Veolia, Motorola, profiteer from different aspects of the Israeli military occupation. The other question about currency, Palestinians in occupied territory use the Israeli shekel, whether there will be some kind of 
monetary union in a two-state solution framework or whether there would be an independent currency, those type of things haven't even been discussed really in any seriousness. Uh, as far as travel documents go, you know, it's, it's a complicated question because um, Palestinians exist in a, a bunch of different administrative areas, including inside the Israeli state, uh, inside the occupied territories. Palestinians in East Jerusalem have a different status as well. Palestinians living in refugee camps outside of historic Palestine have a different status as well. So, um, you know, depending on where you live, you have different travel documents and access to different places. Um, the, the people who are, of course, the most disadvantaged are refugees living outside of historic Palestine and then Palestinians inside the occupied territories, followed by Palestinians in East Jerusalem, what is the Israeli occupied East Jerusalem, and then Palestinians living inside um, the state of Israel. Um, so it's a complex question, but I'd be happy to, to talk to you about it more uh, afterwards. We have a question that comes from uh, Twitter and I will, I will add to this and ask you to kind of expand on it. Um, the uh, tweet asks, now that the two-state solution is dead, um, in quotes, dead, uh, do you see the need for a one democratic uh, state solution? Um, and I would also ask, um, you know, now we have this resumption of a peace process that was uh, announced a few months ago. Um, Syria has overtaken the priorities. The uh, Israeli Prime Minister is already back on the beat about talking about Iran. Um, and President Obama is entering the lame duck period of his presidency. Moving forward into the next several months, the administration talked about at least nine months uh, of, a, of a peace process. How do you see that uh, evolving as we move forward? So the one state, two state question in uh, two minutes, huh? <laughs> <coughs> well, let me first start by saying the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation doesn't take a normative position on whether there should be a one state or two state resolution, viewing that not as an issue that uh, Americans uh, in particular have a, a, a stake in. But uh, in the book, I do go through how Israel's policies have over the past couple of decades made it much more difficult, if not impossible, to conceive of a legitimate two-state solution. And when I talk about a legitimate two-state solution, it's in line with what the Palestinian negotiating team has always presented as a legitimate two-state solution. That is Israel's withdrawal to the pre-1967 armistice lines, the dismantlement of settlements, East Jerusalem as the capital of a Palestinian state, and at least the recognition of Palestinian refugees' right of return. Uh, that's always been what the Palestinian negotiating team has viewed as being a legitimate two-state solution. Now, obviously, Israel's policies over the intervening two decades has made such a vision increasingly unlikely because when Netanyahu came and addressed Congress in 2011, which I quote extensively in this book, he actually admitted that there are now 650,000 Israeli settlers living beyond the Green Line, which is almost three times as many as there were before the quote-unquote peace process started in 1993. Israel just announced plans to build 18, I think it was, 18 train stations throughout the occupied West Bank, investing billions and billions and billions of dollars in this infrastructural development. Now, I'm no urban planner, but you don't sink billions of dollars into an infrastructure project if you're going to leave that territory. It's very clear from these negotiations and what's been leaked that Israel has no intention whatsoever of dismantling a single settlement in the West Bank. And it's very clear that Israel is moving in the direction of imposing de facto a one-state resolution to the conflict. That's the reality of continued Israeli colonization of Palestinian land. The question is, when do we get to the breaking point? When do we break out of this paradigm of the quote-unquote two-state solution being the only game in town? And that's the question that Ian Lustig addressed in his op-ed in the New York Times on Sunday, which I would definitely urge you uh, to check out. I thought it was brilliant. So we're clearly getting, I think right now we're in a bit of an interregnum where the peace process has clearly failed. The two-state resolution to the conflict is obviously diminishing in terms of prospects. 
and that we're waiting for a new dynamic to take hold, and I think it is taking hold. Uh, the question is how long it will take to get there, and the answer is I don't know, and that's the thing about social change. You never know when that change is going to happen. Every single activist who I've spoken to, and there have been a lot of them, who are active in the anti-apartheid movement against South Africa, not a one of them believed that they would see an end to apartheid in their lifetime. And they didn't see it coming until it happened. And that's, that's the reality of social change, that you continue to do this work in the hope and the faith that eventually there will come a tipping point that will change the dynamics and present a situation where there can be a just and lasting peace. Uh, hopefully it will happen sooner rather than later. I think based on the progress of the BDS movement and its increasing successes, I think it's going to happen sooner than a lot of people think. Uh, in terms of Yusuf's question, I think the Obama administration is clearly hoping to be able to say it gave it one last good old college try and then retire to the midterm election saying we tried our best. As, as I go through in this book, this was one of the primary mechanisms through which the Obama administration tried to get itself off of the hook. They said, we can't want peace more than the parties want peace themselves. This was a mantra that was repeated over and over by Clinton, by Obama, after negotiations failed in 2010. So this is undoubtedly what will happen. The Obama administration, we tried our best. The parties don't want peace. There's nothing more we can do. Let's kick this issue down the road. Josh, thank you very much. Um, the book is available here for uh, purchase and for uh, signing as well. Uh, so again, join me in thanking Josh for his presentation tonight. <laughs>